Okay. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for turning up at 10 o'clock in the morning on Saturday to the hangover talk slot. <laughs> so, pretty much. Um, That's for you. Getting <laughs> out of bed. So, pretty much. Um, I'm screw in case you didn't figure that out already. Uh, we've got Storm Carlson, Vidiot, and Datagram up here. And the talk that we're doing is entitled Social Message Relay, Using Existing Social Networks to Transmit Covert Messages in Public. So you've probably you know, read the description of this either on the website or in the program or something like that. And you've got a pretty good idea of you know, what you've come to see. Well, not really. The description we gave you, while accurate, doesn't exactly tell you 100% of what we're going to be doing here. Um, I'm not going to say anything more. I'm going to let everyone else go ahead and take care of that. So without further ado, here is Mr. Strom Carlson. Actually, I think Datagram. Yeah, way to fuck yeah. that up. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's, that's my fault. We um, also sucked in rehearsal. <laughs> Assuming there was actually a, a rehearsal. Well, at least from Can everybody hear me? A, wait a second. Yes? <laughs> no? OK. Um, so. Throughout history, there have been a lot of ways to do this, uh, a lot of different approaches. What the fuck is this? And one of those has been number stations. Um, and does anybody know what number stations are? Show of hands. Okay. Uh, for those of you who don't know, it's shortwave radio stations that broadcast series of encrypted numbers, um, pretty much any way you want to encode a message. Um, and this is just one of the types of ways to do social message relay, but it's kind of popular as far as geek scene goes, just because it's kind of creepy, kind of, um, what am I thinking of? <laughs> well, uh, anyways, spy next slide, yeah, spy world, <laughs> that kind of stuff, so. So a little bit of history. They've been reported since around World War II, probably earlier, um, but reported since World War II. Um, the big thing about them is that there are a lot of irregularities during major world events. Uh, I listed two on the bottom that are big, big things as far as Russia is concerned. Um, and when big world events happen, a lot of number station spikes in activity um, broadcasting happen. Um, so give you an idea of what these are used for potentially. And again, spike in appearance since 90. So I like how there's no text. Dude, you oh, that. sweet. <laughs> I didn't know I was this fancy. <laughs> Anyways, um, some prerequisite paranoia. Most people think, and some of these may are, well, confirmed with quotes around it, uh, to be used by intelligence agencies. And the ones that most people think are using them are listed there, CIA, MI6 is England, KGB is former Soviet Union, BND is Germany, and Mossad's Israel, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Uh, also rumored to be used by organized crime, groups like that. So, we have some examples, just so you guys could hear how these work. Um, this is the Lincolnshire Poacher. It's a pretty um, famous, famous number station, and it's still broadcasting. I don't know from where, but if I'm not mistaken, it's, uh, yeah, it's MI6 operated. That was just a little clip. It goes on 24 hours a day sometimes, sometimes not. For weeks on end, it'll be off. Um, but that's the basic format. It's music and then some more like numbers or phonetic alphabets, sometimes just rising note scales. Uh, we have another one. This one's a bit more creepy. Uh, it's called the Swedish Rhapsody. German girl rattling off spy numbers. <laughs> um, and something we were really interested in, uh, most recently there was the appearance of VoIP number stations. All of these, these two previous examples, have been over shortwave, um, which is, for, from what I understand, a lot harder to operate than a VoIP line, but um, easier, or harder to trace. So we have the example of the VoIP station. Yeah, we, we saw 
Luxor at MP3 cutting up, so this one didn't get cut up. But we just let it go to the numbers. Group six. One seven. Group six. One seven. Zero six. One zero seven. Zero six. One it's zero seven. Okay, so basically, um. We, we found this and we were really interested in it. How many of you number station people heard of this? So few. Few of you. Okay. Um, we're here to tell you that was us. We decided to see how hard it would be to make one and get it transmitted through social networks. Um, so Strom's going to talk to you next about basically getting it set up. So basically, those of you who so of, of those of you who heard of it, how, who many, how many of you dialed the number station directly? All right. Yeah. So yeah, that, that, that number station was running off my asterisk box in my apartment the whole time. Um, so <laughs> it's just basically it's assembled a series of sound clips on my box that I threw together. So assembling the audio for the number station was an interesting project because there are several things you have to consider. First, you need some music. Second, you need, you know, numbers which are not identifiable as a single person, and uh, then you need some way of having encoded messages delivered. So the first bit about the music was actually fairly simple. I was driving around in my car, and I had my iPod on shuffle mode, and I have the Conet Project uh, CDs on my iPod. So how many of you have heard of the Conet Project? Okay. It's basically so a connection of, of the number station kind of things we just played. Yeah. It's basically, for, for those of you who haven't heard of it, it's like a four CD set of recordings of all various number stations. So it's a long, lot of number stations. So my app is on shuffle mode, so it's like playing. C-O-N-E-T. I'm sorry? C-O-N-E-T. Yeah. And they're free for download. Yeah. So, m so I'm listening, I'm driving around, there's like the Cars plays, and then a, a spy number station plays, and then an AHA song that I had on their plays. And I'm listening to the bridge of this AHA song, and I'm like, you know, that kind of sounds like it might be a number station. So when it came time to do the number station, I said, well, I'll just use the bridge of that song as the music for the number station. So it's an AHA song called Little Black Heart. So then to get the various recordings of the numbers, I, w I, I considered several options. The first was recording my voice saying one, two, three. But then I thought, no, I've given talks. People recognize my voice. And then I thought, well, I could go to a coffee shop or something and stick a microphone in someone's face and say, hey, say the numbers one through zero. But then they I just get weird looks, and people might say, oh, that was me, I'm, and I know this person. So I discovered that, how many of you have heard of Craigslist? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. yeah. So how many of you have, have browsed through Craigslist and found people advertising services with telephone numbers attached to them? OK, people will, will list you know, for services of, of various personal nature uh, <laughs> with, with uh, telephone numbers t to call them. So it turns out that when you call people who are expecting calls from random people and you just repeat the same thing over and over and over again, eventually they'll repeat it back to you just to get you to try and say something different. So what I've got here is a, a collection of... <laughs> What I've got here is a collection of, of, of the recordings of the other side of the conversation. This doesn't include me saying the numbers, so I'll just um, I'll, I'll pretend to be them. And it also doesn't include the beep tone that plays to let them know that they're being recorded, because I didn't want that on the number station. But so you go ahead and play this. Hello. One. One. Hello. One. 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 <laughs> There's more. Hello? Two. Hello? Two. Two? <laughs> Hello? Three. Three. Do you want hello? <coughs> May I hear you? Three. Who is three? <laughs> three. I don't know. <laughs> Hi there. You've reached three six four. 
I'm not around to take your call right now, but if you leave me a message, I'll get back to you as soon as possible. Hello? Five. Five? Five what? <laughs> Hello? Six. Hey. Six. How's it going? Huh? Six. 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 <laughs> okay. Bye. Ciao. Message. Hello? Seven. Yes? Seven. Hello? Seven. How you doing? Seven. This is Kevin? Seven. Seven? <laughs> Hello? Eight. Hello? Eight. Eight who? Hello? Nine. Who? Nine. What nine? I, d I don't have zero because I accidentally deleted that recording. But <laughs> that's pretty much how we did it. That's why it sounds like the audio equivalent of those ransom notes with the little letters from every <laughs> newspaper. <laughs> because it pretty much is. Yeah, next slide. So then all I did was I wrote an AGI script, run it on my asterisk box, cut, cut all these up into little half second clips, and wrote an AGI script to encrypt the message every time you call it, because that was easier than putting the encrypted messages in separate files. So you just encrypt the message, and then it turns it into numbers, and it reads back all the numbers. So we've got what, what we've actually got is I've got CDs of all the little pieces, and I'll be tossing those out into the audience later. And that has the AGI script on it. So if, if you want to make your own number station, you'll have the kit on the CD. This is a, a snippet of the code to play back the numbers. We just thought that would look cool. Yeah. yeah. We <laughs> thought that was the coolest part of the script. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. And so now I turn it over to Vidyat and we uh, get into the history of Project Evil. Yeah, Project Evil is the name we gave the... Uh, experiment because we wanted to be able to talk to talk about it at 2600 meetings without other people going louder into the mic. Sorry. <laughs> Move this damn thing. We wanted to be able to talk about this at 2600 meetings without other people knowing what we were saying or, or, or that we were referring to mind Fraulein. So we called it Project Evil. I have no idea where the name came from. It's stupid. The this this section is going I'm going to walk you through everything that happened to us while we were doing it because this kind of became an international phenomenon for a short while and I want to it's, as you can see by the t subtitle there, it's aimed at uh, anyone who might be interested in running a crypto challenge someday, learn from our mistakes, because we made quite a few. So, let's get up here, it's just easier. Okay, how it all began. Well, this picture is of Philippe's Deli in downtown LA. That's where LA 2600 meets. And because we live in the People's Republic of California, we have to go outside to smoke, so we get all our really bad ideas on this piece of sidewalk. That's why I put it there. <laughs> so, we had the idea, why not set up a number station by VoIP? It, it happened right after Datagram had given a talk about the uh, history of number stations. And what, well, what it was was number stations by VoIP. How? We decided we were going to release about four number stations, use one-time pads to encrypt them, and we were going to repeat the key on the first and last, one on first and last messages, hoping someone would look for a key collision. Um, if you're not familiar with how one-time pads work, they're a very old form of encryption, but they're considered almost unbreakable. If you don't know what the exact key is, all possible decryptions are mathematically equally probable. Now, the reason why key collision is so often used to try to crack these is because it's very unlikely that you'll get one key that will produce two sensible messages, or will decrypt two, two separate messages sensibly. So we were hoping we could get someone to do this. And because the messages were very short, we didn't think it would be too much trouble to get someone to write a script and let their computer do all the work. And the reason why we did it is we wanted to see if we could estimate how big and powerful the online cryptographic community was. We just wanted to throw it out there and see what would happen. So on May 8th, we posted this on the New York's Craig's, Craigslist. Craigslist. <laughs> For mine, Fraulein. Mine, Fraulein, I haven't heard from you in a while. Won't you call me? And this 212 number. This was the first number station we set up. We let this mellow for a couple days, and then we sent one email. And I want to stress that all we did to start this whole experiment was send one email. Sent this one to the spooks list. That's a mailing list for uh, 
uh, number stations enthusiasts. Uh, Screw, posing as somebody named J Random Entity, sent this email to them, where basically said, hey, I found this weird phone number you call, and it sounds like a number station. You should check it out. You don't have to read the whole thing. So on May 11th, we got 61 calls to that number in the first 24 hours. On May 24th, it showed up on the Off the Hook radio show. Now, th we think we know how this happened. Bernie S., it turns out, who is a member of uh, the Off the Hook crew, is subscribed to the Spooks numbers list. So on that day, suddenly the number got 117 calls. And by that point, it had been building slowly. More and more people had been posting about it. It had been spreading. And we'd received almost a little over 1,700 calls by that point. On May 29th, we released the second number, and it got 218 in the first 24 hours. So things were, interest was starting to build. We were getting a lot of, seeing, starting to see posts turn up in blogs, more and more people linking back and forth. Spe a lot of speculation flying around, what the hell are these things? On May 31st, Homeland Stupidity posted an article about us. And this was really kind of the first salient event in the whole thing. Uh, because this was the first time the community actually tried to get organized to crack these codes. Um, Michael Hampton, the guy who runs Homeland Stupidity, uh, organized his forums and he created a new forum for each message where people could post and they could put up their theories and start working on them together. And then all of a sudden, on June 1st, slash dot, out of the blue. We had no clue that was coming. <laughs> the number stations 1 and 2 got 2,180 calls thanks to slash dot. It was just amazing. It caught us completely by surprise. I think I got a phone call at like 3 a.m. So yeah. I'm going, oh my God, go to Slashdot right now. Well, <laughs> I, I think it's also got digged for all stations, all numbers that we did. Um, but as far as I know, they never hit the front page, but they have something like 2,500 digs each at this something point. Like that, yeah. I think and the, then that 2,180 calls was like the day it got slash dotted. Yeah. Yes. And but then disaster struck for us. <laughs> On June 20th, the guys who run the HOPE uh, conference back east created a copycat number station. They recorded ours, recut it, and then they announced it on the Off the Hook radio show, and this is what they posted on Craigslist. Parasites. <laughs> <laughs> Our fourth number station we released just after the HOPE contest, but it only received 22 calls, because everyone thought that it was all a stunt to promote hope up to that point. Interest just took a nosedive in this thing immediately after it. They, they were smart, they struck while the iron was hot, and they got in right with the best perfect time to make a publicity coup out of this, but uh, they killed it afterwards. We never really got the level of interest back up to the point where we, it was before. And as you can see from this, 146 calls total, and then it just kept getting worse. So yeah, on July 15th, we finally had our first real meeting to discuss what the hell we were going to do, because, you know, we're hackers, we're not exactly organized. We decided what we would do is create six more messages instead of the original four. And we were going to release a batch of them in quick succession to try to get people's interest back up. We thought maybe if, if the people who were still following this thing thought, wow, something's going on, maybe this is heating up, maybe it's related to the Mideast or something, it might get out there and get more exposure. So these are the uh, numbers that we continue to release. Ottawa, Lubbock, Orlando, Milwaukee, and Fort Lauder Lauderdale. As far as I know, no one ever actually found Fort Lauderdale. It's still there. <laughs> no, they, they did. Uh, it finally got published, but I believe it was like a week after the fact or two weeks after the fact. Okay. I thought that was Milwaukee that you got late. Uh, it was one of them. No, there, there, was, yeah. there was one of them, I Lubbock think. Lubbock was late. No, Lubbock, Lubbock was late. No, one, no one's found Fort Lauderdale yet, as far as I can tell. Yeah. So, and we didn't do anything different. We just would put them up on the, his asterisk box and then push out an uh, ad on uh, Craigslist with the title Four Mine Fraulein. Ostensibly, there were people out there running scripts that were checking Craigslist all the time to see if they could find a new one, but apparently their scripts suck because they never found that one. <laughs> so, in total, the first four numbers received 58% of the calls. And the first four numbers were also up for a much shorter period of time. So if you really look at the call detail records, uh, you can see that uh, we, we, we did manage to rekindle some interest, but it didn't really ever come back fully. Now, uh, before I go into Easter eggs, I should also tell you the reason why we decided to do six number stations and try to rekindle some interest was right before the Off the Hook contest, we called Dark Tangent. 
the fellow that runs DEF CON, and we let him in on the secret. We said, we want to do this, but we can't have anything published, otherwise it'll just, it'll, it'll be blown. So DT kept it secret from the rest of the DEF CON staff and from everybody else and put us up here under the pseudonym of Social Message Relay. Uh, just wanted to make sure I put that in because I forgot to put in a slide for it. Now, for those of you who are actually following MindFileLine, here's some Easter eggs that you may or may not have found. First, the group numbers. Originally, the group numbers were supposed to identify the city the next message was going to appear in. But then, Will Wheaton posted this on Slashdot. Anyway, my prediction, the next message will be posted on Craigslist for Boston. The first message announced group 415, and the second message was posted on Craigslist for San Francisco. Thanks for blowing my surprise, Ensign Crusher. <laughs> so, on messages three through six, we changed the group numbers to 134, 205, 022, and 169, which, re which when rearranged, become the octets of willwheaton.net. <laughs> <laughs> Similarly, the 7th through 10th messages are 116, 018, 216, and 254, and when rearranged, that's la2600.org. Also, the initials of the cities that they were released in, if you read them in order, <laughs> somebody actually figured out NSA and posted about that on, on Homeland Stupidity and got really excited about it, but then he stopped. <laughs> so. Why don't we decrypt a couple messages? <laughs> now, also, before I go into this, I should say, for reasons that will become clear, we're not going to release the decryptions of the first four messages yet. As I said, after the first four messages were published, we finally had a meeting and got reorganized, and we're going to start with the sixth message and go from there. If you keep following this, you'll eventually hear what the first four messages were, but we're not going to decrypt those here in this talk today. All right, the 613 number. The one-time pad for that was, I found two pennies in my pocket, here is my two cents. We should probably explain the one-time pads. Yeah. You, um, you want to explain it? There's a guy, if, if you subscribe well, no, to I'll, the... I'll, I'll start the next line in my talk, do you mind? Oh, <laughs> sorry, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I was just going to say, there's a guy who shows up to the 20, LA 2600 meetings, and those of you, I see some familiar faces out here, will know who I'm talking about. <laughs> I'm not going to mention his name, because he'd be mad, but this guy is... Uh, well, he puts a new spin on the word weird. <laughs> and when you're hanging out with a bunch of hackers, that's hard. <laughs> okay. but, uh, he, he, he's known for posting these somewhat ranting, very bizarre emails that yet somehow make a weird kind of cool sense. <laughs> I, I can't explain it. Uh, anyway, we decided that you could not get a better random text generator in the world than an email this guy posted to our list. <laughs> So we just started grabbing random ones out of our archive. So those of you who are, are with LA2600 or have been subscribed to the LA2600 mailing list uh, will probably recognize some of these. Yeah. And if you pipe his email into uh, dev random, you get back pi. <laughs> the full thing. <laughs> OK. So how the decryptions work. When you call the number station, you get you know group 415 and then a series of digits. Those digits are the decimal ASCII representations of letters padded with zeros to make them fill out the space. When you take out the padded zeros, you get ciphertext that looks like this, 14, 83, 2, etc. You take the one-time pad, again converted to decimal ASCII, zor it out, and that gives you your clear text. And in this case, the clear text is... <laughs> we figured it was appropriate. <laughs> this is at the point where we knew we were going to be giving this talk. Yeah. And I'm just going to speed through the rest of these, hitting them really fast because you don't want to read a bunch of random numbers. The 806 number was also, the one-time pad was also having a hard time locating my salt lick and hip waders. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's really one of his. And that decrypts to Captain's Log Start 2006 2006.06.2, pwned by Ensign Crusher. <laughs> <laughs> the 407 number. Be careful what you say, it will always come back at you, and you will be quoted. How little did he know? <laughs> and this is a, an apology to the spooks list, because we did have some trepidation about actually launching our experiment off of their back and you know, detracting their attention from other might what might possibly be meaningful work. So legitimate stations. <laughs> what? Legitimate stations. Yeah, legitimate number stations, not a bunch of drunken idiots like us. <laughs> and the 414 number. 
This one is, as the media reporting the Pope being unavailable, I have not yet received permission to eat meat on Friday. I have no idea what the hell that email was about. <laughs> this, this was the most sane sentence in that email that he sent. This is like the only one that was like even in English. <laughs> Thank you, priest. <laughs> So this one was our thank you to Michael Hampton and, and to the cryptographic community, but especially to Michael Hampton, because if you go to Homeland Stupidity and you start reading all the forums, by the time you get to the 10th number station, that poor guy is going completely insane. <laughs> you could tell by the tone. He is just pulling his hair out, beating his head against the desk. He really wants to know what these things say. So we had to mention him. And the final number... I hope and wish none of you is enamored enough with me to quote my rantings. <laughs> In case you want to use my writings as evidence, I will gladly refer you. Again, I have no idea what the hell that means. <laughs> this one is aimed at the organizers of the Hope Contest. Dear Emmanuel, glad to see creativity is alive and well over 2600 Magazine. If you ever need help, again, give us a call. <laughs> Parasite. <laughs> Total cost to set this up, by the way, for everything including our web page, was $202. Now, I put that in because those of you who work in a big company, go back and ask your marketing department if they can get three months of international exposure and 20,000 phone calls for $202. <laughs> so, running a crypto challenge. Here's our advice to you. Learn from our mistakes, and most importantly, I think, be organized and have all your content ready before you start. When we were doing the first four numbers, we would just pick stuff at random at the time we were setting up the station. Part of the reason why we're not decrypting those messages is because the content was not really well thought out and would not uh, fit well with what we're continuing to do. Second, don't underestimate the cryptographic community, but don't overcomplicate your challenge. I'll give a little bit more on overcomplication later. And finally, most, maybe most importantly, have a plan to handle copycats like a manual. <laughs> this is the best copycat we got. Mein Fraulein, stop calling me. I told you yesterday I don't love you. Give me back my records and my good leather jacket. <laughs> <laughs> and if whoever posted that in the audience is here, um, come on up. We actually have something for you. We appreciate that greatly. <laughs> in fact, we picked Orlando as a city to release uh, one of our numbers in just because of this guy. <laughs> Now we have some observations we'd like to share about the crypto community because we watched pretty closely as the community tried to decipher these messages and figure out what the hell was going on. And the first, big, and first and biggest one is that the community tends to ignore any answers it doesn't like, even if they're correct. I'd like to read this quote here. But the starter of such a game would hardly, could hardly count on anyone calling the phone number and asking about it online. So the person who first noted it would almost certainly have to be in on it, if not the instigator himself. So that might be a more productive line of inquiry. Okay. That's the most logical thing anyone said about decrypting our number stations. As I said earlier, we sent one email to launch this project. We got exactly one email back saying, where did you find this? We sent them the lamest excuse we could think up, something along the lines of, oh, my buddy found it. He sent it to me because he knows I'm into this stuff. And they bought it. <laughs> we never got, we never heard anything about it again, despite the fact that all the messages and emails were posted online, and supposedly thousands of people were trying to solve all these ciphers, no one ever went back to look for the source. The second thing is, people kept asking, probably up to today, they still are asking, is this real? Is this really a numbers station? Well, duh. <laughs> why go to setting up, why go to the trouble of setting up a number station when you can just use public key encryption? <laughs> it seems like pretty obvious, but the crypto community seems to want to have a mystery to solve. They seem to want to have something to go after, and they put on blinders. So if you're running a crypto challenge, factor that in. Second thing about the crypto community, it seems to only organize to the lowest level necessary. Now, what I mean by that is a, a great example is the Homeland Stupidity Forums and the wiki he put up. There's, if you read through those forms, suppose you're someone brand new who's never heard of this before and is interested. Homeland Stupidity has become the de facto area where people are trying to decrypt them. It is 10 completely separate forms with linear posts going way down the page. And there's tons of misinformation and duplicated effort. No one has actually put up any, in, even the wiki was not well organized. There, there was nothing there that could really help someone dig in and make them more efficient. And actually, any, everything that was there would just slow you down if you were trying to start out. The other thing is, 
The community is incredibly powerful, as evidenced by how quickly they cracked the code from the HOPE contest, but it's not proportionally insightful. Now, that's no different than probably the rest of society. We're all standing on the shoulders of some incredibly brilliant freaks who invented stuff like electricity and medicine, et cetera, et cetera. But in the, the, the crypto community, when someone gets one of those insights, it doesn't necessarily propagate down. Again, usually because of very poor organization thing, or because they're wearing blinders, as I said before. Here's an example. We estimated that there was about 700 different cipher systems tested to decrypt this thing during the time it was up there. Not one single person tried to find a key collision, which is the classic way to decrypt a one-time pad. And um, also, because our messages are very long by my my feelings, um, it wouldn't be hard to identify a real message from a fake message because randomly generating keys and just zoring it against the ciphertext, you, the majority of what you get will be pure garbage um, and versus actually seeing a few words that make sense. So they could have cracked this very easily had they just generated 10 lines of code to just generate random keys and try and zor it against any of our ciphers. So here's our suggestion to the web, commu the web <coughs> cryptanalysis community if they want to make themselves more efficient. We'd like to propose that they, that they or someone build a por web portal, something that's easily deployable so that people who aren't necessarily coders or systems admins can get it out there. Make it open source and extensible. Use common cipher tools, because there are cipher tools written in Perl and PHP and other things that are out there for every kind of transpositional cipher, anything else that you'd ever want. Those tools are already out there sitting in open source repositories, and they're not collected anywhere. There's not one easy to use tool. Next thing is make the tool, make the portal work from a common data set. One of the big problems we saw with people pulling data from a whole bunch of different places was typos. They'd get things from over here, get coast paste it into a blog, cut and paste it and emailed somewhere else. Next thing you know, they're working from something that's completely different from what the original message was. And finally, standardized data reporting. And this is probably the most important part. As with Homeland Stupidity, if you look at it, like I said, lots of linear posts, 10 different forms, lots of stuff to slog through. If, they had, if you had something with an interface that would make it very easy to identify which ciphers have been tested, what was done, with common data reporting, you're going to make yourselves a lot more efficient. Tenth message. If you were keeping track, you may have noticed I only gave you nine so far. So those of you who are following mine, Fraulein, now might be a really good time to get a pencil and a cell phone. <laughs> this appeared, or will appear, very shortly. It appeared about 15 minutes ago after I put my laptop away. <laughs> <laughs> on the Gulfport Biloxi Craigslist, mine, Fraulein, I regret the burden I placed upon you. Confer with me once again by the River's West Bank, and I will take you home. Call me, 228-702-0304. This is going to be the final Mein Fraulein message. Is now, the station up? It's up. Okay. It's on. Now, feel free to call. you're probably thinking, well, that's cool and all, but what am I going to do with another one-time pad? <laughs> this one's not a one-time pad. This one can be cracked with pen and paper. This is the one that people really wanted when this whole thing started, so we decided to give it to you. And we have one more hint, because we like you. And this is what you might want to write down if you're interested in taking a stab at cracking this. When DEF CON is online, there is no hope. <laughs> you might want, I'll give you a moment to write that down. Quick question, though, actually. Is Ilanka in the house? No? OK, good. The rest of you have a chance. <laughs> if you don't know who Ilanka is, she's probably the best amateur cryptologist working in, the, in probably the world right now. She's almost always here at DEF CON, and she's, uh, she, she's uh, famous for solving all the, con, all the CON crypto challenges pretty much the day they're released. So we're going to open up the floor to Q&A right now. Don't be shy. Come on, questions, questions. Come on, somebody must have a question. No? None of you? Wow. Wow. <laughs> One right over there. Oh. I'm sorry, what was the question again? How are you maintaining the anonymity of the phone numbers? Oh, how do I maintain the anonymity of the phone number? Well, pretty much it's along the lines of there's no name associated with the number because I'm buying it through a VoIP, a VoIP company. 
and pretty much it's on the VoIP company to not release my personal information or else I sue their, you know, sorry little ass. So <laughs> that's for the most part it. And also you can theoretically, you know, buy a number station or buy a, a VoIP account with, you know, like a fake PayPal account or one of those pre prepaid cash credit cards or something like that. So you can, you know, if you use that and tour and then put the asterisk box on some random server that you compromise or whatever, you could theoretically make it almost untraceable. But I didn't bother to do that. So. Oh, for the, the for the last station. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Also, one other thing, um, which is sort of related to your question, uh, peripherally, somebody mentioned on one of the many posts that were made in relation to the stations going up. It's really dumb doing this over VoIP because, well, how do you maintain anonymity if you have someone who's actually trying to pick up this message to decode it to get instructions? It doesn't work. Well, yes and no. Um, what you have to remember is that while there may be caller ID records for the VoIP station, number one, there are ways of defeating caller ID. Number two, uh, even with those in place, we still have plenty of people coming up, making MP3s to the station, and then distributing them which other people distribute. I've actually found these things turning up on peer-to-peer -peer networks, which is rather interesting. Uh, we even had one that ended up on uh, You're the Man Now, Dog, <laughs> as an animation that somebody did. So pretty much, it's a pretty good way of getting the message out there, if unreliable. You know, it's well, not necessarily targeted, but it does provide some obfuscation. The, the, the difference between VoIP and using one. shortwave is that you trade. Um, shortwave, you can't identify where people are receiving messages, but with the VoIP, I could just buy a VoIP account, you know, wherever, and they can't, I, they can't identify where it's coming from. Does that make sense? Well, th there's also one yeah. other thing to add to that, which is they can identify where that message is actually located, but they don't have any real way of knowing who placed it. Yeah. So the, the degree of anonymity is still there, but you're trading off one thing for another. And by the way, one thing I noticed uh, looking through the call detail records of these, these VoIP number stations, of the approximately 6,100 calls we received, about 33% came from Skype. And um, I don't know if you guys have figured this out yet, but Skype kind of blows. <laughs> the call quality is horrible, and you can't hear what the numbers are being s the numbers that are being said are. So don't use Skype for this stuff, please, please, please. <laughs> use your phone smart. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Use a real phone. So, any more questions? Ten minutes. Five. Five. Ten. From here, um, well, there's the crypto challenge. You call the number. You write down the numbers it reads back to you, you decrypt the message, and then you get instructions on what to do next in the message. Where are we going with it? We're having fun. <laughs> We're just having fun at this point. Yeah. Our experiment to see what the community is going to do is pretty much over. Yeah. And if anybody wants to try and crack the first four numbers, if you could find them, probably on Homeland Stupidity there's recordings. My suggestion is just generate random keys and Zor against it. That would be the fastest way to do it. And if you ever come across one-time pad encryption, which is, we chose one-time pad because that's traditional with number stations. And we, we thought it was kind of funny in all the comments on all these sites trying to decrypt them. They're like, well, if you shift the bits like to the left and then you, okay. you yeah. zor it against the Bible and like, or, like they're not, and then one guy would go, well, it's a one-time pad and it would just get lost in all the noise. Um, so my advice would be just try and brute force it. Okay. So yes, I think we need to wrap up. Yeah, yeah, we'll we're going to start stage. wrapping up. Um. Uh, okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. So, um, okay, we take a couple more questions. We'll take like one or two more questions. If anyone has any, if anyone has any questions. <laughs> yes. Very last one. Also, we, we, we did go to Kinko's <coughs> and we did pay for the copies. And. <laughs> <laughs> And we, we did make up Crypto Challenge flyers, which will be up and about. So uh, all the stuff is on the flyer, so you don't have to scribble it down too hard. But so those will be distributed. Also, I've got um, some CDs to provide to the audience, which contain recordings of all the number stations right off my PBX, and um, the text of the number stations, and the, the program and the Assemble Your Own Mind, mind for Online Station kit. Plus, we have the best. We, uh, we made Mind for Online t-shirts. Ten dollars today only. Come get yours after the talk out in the hallway. Yeah, come see me. We we have, we have all sizes. Quantities so. are limited. Yeah, <laughs> very very limited. And but if you want more information, go to projectevil.org. <laughs> all right, cool. Thank you very much. Thank you.